Divine Vision is back with Why Jesus. Welcome back to Divine Vision. Today's episode is Why Jesus. With today's cast, Pastor Brian Martin. What up? Miss Becky Martin. Hey, Chad. Aaron Woods. Hi, Chad. And Chad Bearcamp. Thanks, Brian. So if you recall, on last week's episode, we kind of left it hanging that we didn't know when the next episode would come out. Uh, But Brian, we sent him off to South Georgia this week. What kind of conference did you go to? I went to the Georgia Baptist Annual Meeting. Okay. So he went to that, and on the way back home, gave me a call and said, Hey, I have an idea for the next episode. And we said, Okay, let's go with it. So Brian got some questions together. And that's where that's right. Why Jesus, uh, the next episode came from. And before we dive in, also, uh, if you notice, if you're listening, uh, this episode comes out on a Wednesday. That's what we're going to start doing from now on. The new episodes will come out on Wednesday. And on Mondays will be a previous sermon, either that previous Sunday or one from the archives. But uh, the new actual episodes for the podcast will now come out on Wednesdays. Diving into uh, today's episode, Why Jesus? The cast here is going to give a short testimony uh, about when each one of us were saved. So we're going to start with Miss Becky on this one. Miss Becky, tell us your testimony about when you were saved. Okay. So um, I was saved when I was uh, 13 years old. Um, I don't, I cannot tell you the day, time, date, anything like that. Um, Well, I can tell you that it was on a Sunday night, I would say. Um, I remember we had went, at the time we went to New Bethel Baptist Church up up in, on the old highway in Tron. And uh, Bill Holder was the pastor and um he was he was pastor i can't tell you what he preached that night i can tell you though that that is when i realized that if i died i would go to hell so right there why jesus for me in that moment was really so i wouldn't go to hell i didn't want to go to hell and so um of course, the invitation was given. I did not go forward at the church. Um, we went home, had supper. But, of course, the whole time that evening, up, even after we went to bed, um, all I could think about was if something happened and I died, that I was going to I was gonna go to hell. And so at some point after I went to bed, I slipped out of bed and knelt beside my bed all alone and I accepted Jesus that night as my savior Uh, I would love to tell you that everything has been great and I have served him faithfully for what 50 years now 40 years now but that's that would not be the truth I've not always been faithful to Jesus but he's always been faithful to me and so that's when, that's the night I got saved. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned, you know, beside your bed, because a lot of people think you've got to be at church or at the altar or yes. whatever to be saved. And that's not the case. No. Not for everybody. Some it is. All right. Thank you, Miss Becky. All right, Brian, what about you? Yeah, well, um, I was seven years old. It was after vacation Bible school. And we were at home. Uh, You know, as you were saying, you don't have to be at church. You don't have to go down to the altar. I was walking around with a little pamphlet I received at Vacation Bible School looking at it. My dad was cooking supper, and he said, you want to know more about that? And I thought, yeah. Or I told him, yeah, I do. And he took me to his bedroom, set me down on the edge of the bed, and led me to Jesus. Uh, I couldn't tell you the date. I couldn't tell you the year, the what day of the week. I can tell you my dad burnt a gravy. I'm going to write a book one day. Burnt gravy and just be a, we call it a, a 
that you write a book about yourself? Autobiography. 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 I'm gonna write one. <laughs> but burnt gravy saved me. Yep. Hey, that's pretty catchy. <laughs> yeah. He really is. Um, I get some royalty fees off of that whenever you write it. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then uh, let's see. About eleven years later. I announced my calling into the ministry, so um, here I am. Here you are. Still saved to this day. All right, Brian. Is that all you got? That's all I got. That's unlike you. Normally you have a lot more. Yeah. I usually do, but there's, it's simple. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> All right. I accepted Jesus, and he saved me, and he's still with me. That's right. There's nothing else. That's, you're right. Nothing there you else go. to tell. All right. Thanks, Brian. Go ahead, Aaron. Well, Chad, I grew up in church. I attended my first service here at Dry Valley when I was less than a week old at a father and son banquet. As a child, I was drugged to church Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday nights, every day in between. You named it, we were here for it. When I turned, I remember when I was 12, and I believe it was in 2005. It was a Sunday night. There was an Easter play, and I believe my grandmother actually wrote it. And I remember something that was said, something that was done, got a hold of me, and that's the night that I knew I didn't want to die and go to hell. And much like Miss Becky said, I've not been faithful my whole life. Back in 2017, I finally realized that. I rededicated my life, got baptized, and fully surrendered to what God would have for me to do. And since then, I'm not perfect, but I try every day. Not perfect, just forgiven. Yes, ma'am. I think that's what a lot of people think, though. Like when you're when you're saved, you're you're gonna be perfect, not ever mess up or not. Exactly. You know? But we're, none of us are perfect. We always mess up. We always have little things that we fall short with. and Very true. That's why we have the grace of God. All right. Okay, Chad. What about you? My turn. Well, so I was baptized. If you remember back in the first episode, or the second episode, I guess, um, I said that I had went to a different church. It was the Church of Christ. And if you're not familiar with them, they like to dunk you as possible as they can, or as soon as they can, you know. <clears throat> Whenever you say that you want to be baptized, they'll baptize you just right there. And and much other than that, they, I mean, you know, there's not much more teaching, I guess, that, you know, that their goal is just to get you baptized kind of thing. And so I was going there with, with uh, my girlfriend at the time, and that's just where I started going, and I was baptized. I, you know, thought that's what I needed to do. But they never really mentioned the word saved much. That's just not, they kind of stray away from that word. Um, so, you know, I went from 15 until 31, 32, somewhere in there. And went through a divorce, came here, came back here in 2018. And from 2018 to 20, 2020, 2021, like I just, I felt the Lord working on me. And didn't know what it was. And leading up through, I guess, the first part of 2021, I can remember going to the altar a lot. And I didn't know why. You know, I just, sometimes I'd go and almost forget why I was going. I just felt like I needed to go. I'd go pray and sometimes get there and not even know what I was praying about. Um, but then uh, it was the VBS, the Sunday VBS started in 2021. I was standing up there behind the video and, you know, from most of my life, especially coming back to Dry Valley, I don't know how many preachers I've heard, how many people I've heard say, you know, do you know that you know that you know? And they would always say, you know, if you were to die right now, where would you go? And I'd always say heaven. That's just because I, I thought, you know, I was saved. And, but something that morning kind of hit me. The singing was great. The preaching was great. And something just fell off. I just knew something wasn't right. And the preacher said the same questions, you know, if you were to die right now, where would you go? But then he asked one question. 
He said, have you ever been baptized before or thought you were saved before, but now you're not so sure. Now, I don't, I probably have heard that question before, but I don't remember it kind of sinking in like it did that morning. And so right then, I think we were praying at the time. Everybody's heads was bowed and eyes were closed. And we had sang countless songs that day. It just seems like every song, we just kept singing another song, another song, another verse, another verse. And so he was going to do one more verse. And once he asked that question, it hit me like I'm not saved anymore. Right? I wasn't saved. And so as soon as he ended that prayer, I, I honestly don't remember how I got to the altar. Like it just, Jesus himself had to have carried me because I don't remember taking that first step. But I went down that morning and hit my knees and prayed and accepted Jesus. And, you know, like Becky and everybody else has said, it's not been, I haven't been perfect since then. It's not been a bed of roses, but I know now, um, if my life were to end where I'd be going. So yeah, that's my, that's my story. I like what y'all are saying, how it's not been a bed of roses or it's not been easy. Because it's not, I mean, for every one of us, and I believe every Christian to ever walk the face of the earth would tell you that it's not an easy thing to do. But hear me when I say we have a hope. Absolutely. A hope for tomorrow. And that's what keeps us going. It's not that it's easy. It's not that it's going to get easier. It's that we know who holds our tomorrow. We know our eternity, where our eternity lies, and that tomorrow will be a better day than today was. Yeah, and, you know, going along with that, you know, looking back, like if I, if I were to die right now, I know now, you know, that I'm where I'll go. But looking back over that, what, 16, 17-year span when I thought I was saved, you know, there, there was times during that time span that I don't know how I made it out of it. You know, I don't, I feel like I shouldn't be here because of certain things. And looking back, if, if my life would have ended then, you know, I, I guess at the time I thought I was, but looking back, I wasn't saved. So I don't think I'd be. That's how Satan works though. Yeah. yeah. He'll give you that false sense of security. So that's why you have to make sure as, as you said, you know, you've got to know that you know that you know. Yep. And if you can't say that you know that you know that you know, then you need to make a change. Absolutely. It doesn't hurt to get saved again. If you know, I mean, if you, I'm not saying get saved again, but to make sure yeah. if you're doubting, it's okay to make sure that right. that you're secure. Exactly. So we've got a, a number of questions here like we did last week. Uh, we're going to ask these questions and then go around the room and uh, answer them uh, however we see fit. So the first question uh, for why Jesus is who is Jesus Christ? Brian? Well, I'll tell you that most people believe that Jesus Christ was a human being and that Jesus Christ lived a life in Israel around 2,000 years ago. But the, I guess the, the question at hand is more about Jesus Christ's identity. Because we can, I mean, we can sit here and preach to you all day that Jesus Christ was a human being, that he was a good man, that he was a, a godly man, a good teacher, Prophet. A, a prophet, but that doesn't sum up who Jesus was. He was God in the flesh. John ten thirty is Jesus' words. It's in red in my Bible, and it's where Jesus says, I and my Father are one. So he claims that he is God in the flesh. And that's exactly who Jesus was. You can also go to John 1, 1, where it says, In the beginning 
was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word there is referring to Jesus himself because he was the word made flesh. Right. Actually, and that that is John 1, 14, where it says that the word was made flesh. So when I saw that question, I guess I went, I just pulled up uh, some verses. Um, I guess what Jesus is referred to as, you know, throughout the Bible, uh, like Matthew one, uh, Emmanuel, um, God with us, John 14. Uh, he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. First Timothy, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. We've got revelations, alpha and omega. He was referred to as the chosen in Matthew 12 deliverer, Romans 11, light of the world, John 9, life, John 14, prince of peace, Isaiah 9. I mean, you know, there's multiple that you can continue going on and on and on. But that's just, when I saw the question, that's just kind of what came to my mind. What does he, you know, obviously he was a man, he was human, he came to earth. But I guess my mind went to who is he referred to as throughout the Bible. As As we look into the Old Testament, we see many prophecies about the coming Messiah. With the prophecies about Jesus being Messiah, there was a, you know, a, the prophecy of the coming Messiah, but absolutely no one could fulfill that role of Messiah unless they were righteous before God, and the only person that can be righteous before God is God himself. So that makes Jesus God. But to be that ultimate sacrifice, you have to die, and God can't die. So he had to become human, God in the flesh. That's good. That's real good. Good job, Brian. All right, so our next question, is Jesus really the Messiah? Yes, he is. Um, In the previous question, Brandon went back to the Old Testament and the Old Testament um, gave lots of prophecy about the Messiah. Um, The book of Isaiah tells us that he was a Jew and that he was going to be born of a virgin. The book of Micah tells us that he was born in Bethlehem or was going to be born in Bethlehem. And Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies. And so by that, that that leads us to believe that he is the Messiah because right. he fulfilled all of the prophecies that was made. Exactly. It's a very good answer. Thank you. Brian? Sorry, Miss Becky. Is that all you had? Yes. On that? Uh, to go along with the Old Testament prophecies, it was also prophesied that he would be a prophet like Moses, that he would be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. He would be a king, uh, the son of David. And he would be one that suffered before entering his glory. So along with all those others, I mean, he met every prophecy that was foretold about the coming Messiah. All right, so our next question, what does it mean that Jesus saves? It means that Jesus took the ultimate punishment for my sin and your sin. And if I accept him, accept his gift of salvation and believe that he lived the perfect life, he died a wrongful death, and that he rose again on the third day, He'll take my sin and place them on himself so I don't got to take that punishment. Yep. Like to me, like just looking at that question on the surface, what does it mean that Jesus saves? I mean, that's, to me, it means exactly what it says. It saves me from um, living eternity in hell. 
I mean, that that's just, I know it's kind of a simple answer, but that's just, I mean, there's steps to get that. You can't, he's not just going to, you, know, you can't live the life that you want to live and expect that. You know, you have to accept him. You have to um, live the life according to the Bible. But it means, as long as you do that, it means exactly what it says. He's going to save you in the end. You're going to spend eternity with him. I've put, I just simply put that he, if you accept him, he rescues you. He rescues you from dying and going to hell. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I, I know there's more of a, a, a deeper answer here and there, but you know, on the, at the same time, to me, I, th- I feel like it's simple. It is to me. I, I agree. It's the same. Um, he came to um, be a sacrifice for us to keep us out of hell. Um, it, uh, to me, I also think about that God created us to have a relationship with him. And then in the garden, Adam and Eve, you know, did what they weren't supposed to do. And the fall of man then brought sin into the world. So God God already had a plan in place um, to, to um, what's the word I'm looking for, to, to restore that relationship with him. Because right. when when sin entered the world, then no longer could we could could man walk with with God or be with God because God cannot be cannot partake where there's sin. Yeah, because He's holy. So God sent Jesus to restore the relationship with Him, so that we can one day have a relationship with God. We may be wondering. What does it mean that Jesus saves? It also raises another question. Why do I need to be saved? So I guess to kind of go into this, we have to consider the fact that we're all sinners. What's a sinner? Somebody who does wrong against God. Mm -hmm. Because we're sinners, there's absolutely no way we can get to God. There's nothing we could do, no amount of money we could bring, nothing that'll get us in that relationship with God besides the saving grace of right. Jesus Christ. Exactly. Accepting his gift of salvation, allowing Jesus to cover the sins of our life with his blood, and wash them as white as snow. That's the only hope we ever have by dying in our place. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus is God, so he has that righteousness of God, but then he was human, so he could die the death that we're supposed to die. That's what he did. He came, he lived the perfect life, because we can't, and then at his death, all the sin of the world was placed on him, and he became that sacrifice. What's a sacrifice? A sacrifice is something that takes your place. I mean, if you go back to the Old Testament sacrifice, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, they would take and lay their hands on the animal to symbolically say, this animal is taking my place. So that's what we're doing with Jesus Christ. And when we accept him, we're saying symbolically that Jesus Christ has took our place so that we don't got to do it. Right. And what better gift is there than that? You know, because if you die without Jesus Christ, you don't have a future. Yeah. That's exactly right. And that'll be one of our questions. You got a hot future. A hot future. A hot future. To say the least. Yeah. So, Brian, you say that. Our next question is what happens if I don't accept Jesus Christ? Truthfully, this is harsh. Now, this is going to sound bad, but it's the truth. You're going to go to hell. Because we we live in a world today that the idea is Jesus is a, or, you know, God is a loving God. 
how could he send somebody to hell? And, and the answer to that, he doesn't send anybody to hell. We, we send our own selves there. But we don't like to hear sermons on hell. We don't like to hear anybody preaching about it, teaching about it. We just like to think we can just live our daily lives the way we want to. And we're going to heaven, you know, at the end of the right. day. That's, and that's not true. God is right. love, but he's also sovereign. And he's one day going to be a very wrathful God. Yes. And that's not just the view of the, or the opinion of the podcast. Right. That's biblical. That's biblical. He is a just God. He's a fair God. I mean, we want justice and fairness and all us aspects of this life. When we get to our eternity, would it be fair to me having lived my life in accordance to God's word to go to heaven, but then the sinner standing beside me having never accepted Jesus Christ, living his life the way he wanted to live it, going to heaven too? Would that be fair? Would that be just? No. No. God demands a hell. I have a sermon on that. Every aspect of God demands that there be a hell. Because, I mean, God can't look upon sin. Right. And if... Someone doesn't accept his salvation. Why should he make them spend an eternity with him? Right. If they don't choose God in this life, why would he choose them in the next? Yep, exactly. And, you know, something that comes to my mind when I see this, a question like this, you know, the the world, like I said, wants to believe that you're going to go to heaven regardless or whatever. And then there's some that they just want to live whatever they want to. They don't want to, they don't accept that there's a God. They don't accept there's a heaven, there's a hell. But in my, I guess my way of thinking is, you know, first, uh, you know, I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Bible, believe in heaven and hell. But let's just say, just for a minute, let's just say we're wrong about this whole thing. At the end of the day, whenever we take our last breath here, let's just say we, we take our last breath and we're just done. There, there's nothing else. What have I lost, you know, by living the Christian life? What have I lost by going day in and day out and living the way that the Bible said to do? And not to say that I do it perfectly. I mean, I mess up, right. but, you know, living as best I can. What have I lost? But on the other hand, what if I choose to live my life the way I want to, you know, and then at the end of the day, when I, or at the end of my life, whenever I take that last breath, I wake up on the other other side. What if there is yet the other side? What have I lost then? I've lost everything. everything. And so for me, it's one of those things. I don't mean to downgrade it, but almost like a better safe than sorry kind of thing. Yes. You know, I would much rather live my life today for God and there not be a God right. than to live my life for the world. you're not losing nothing. Exactly. Like that. But if you live your life for God, then he's going to reveal himself to you in ways that you know that it was only God yes. that did that. So then you're going to know there. Yes. You're not just you're not just living for him saying, OK, I'm going to live for him and right. hope for the best. Absolutely. I mean, you experience things where, you know. Yes. He's real. Yeah, there's. Not to get into, uh, y'all have told your testimony and stuff before. You know, I could just imagine, I would, you saying that would make me feel like, you know, you know there's a God. You've, yes. you've experienced that. And like you said, there's been things in my life, I'm sure in Aaron's life, that looking back, it just hits you. Like, mm-hmm. God really helped me through that. So, there's no ways you could face some of the stuff we do face in this life if you didn't have a God. Exactly. Yeah. Or if you didn't have the God, let's put it yes. that way. Right. Yeah, because there's there's some things that happen like you know, there's times you, you go through your life, you're literally alone as far as mm-hmm. physical people around you. But you know when God's there. You can feel him there with you. 
Yes. All right. So our next question is salvation really free? There's no way I could ever earn it, ever deserve it, ever pay for it. If it wasn't free, I wouldn't have it. Exactly. That's good, Aaron. The Bible clearly states that salvation is free. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Exactly. That whosoever. Everybody. So the Bible clearly states that salvation is free to all. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should have everlasting life. And just like you said, Chad, whosoever, that means anybody. Yes. It's free for everybody. And Romans six twenty three says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So exactly. that's another one of those black and white questions. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. It is what it is. Salvation is accompanied by good works. So while it is free to accept the gift, once you accept it, you've got to live like it. Yeah. So it's going to come with conse- uh, not consequences. Sacrifices. Yeah. I think that's the word I was looking for. That's better than consequences. It comes with sacrifices. Conditions? Con- uh, conditions, sacrifices, where you turn from the life that you once lived. Yes. And you go toward the life God wants you to live. And, you know, you, you hit on that. Some people, I feel like they are hesitant to accept Jesus. Or to even go to the altar and pray because they're like, you know, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done or, you know, whatever. I don't really care. And Jesus doesn't care. Right. The, but, you know, we still have that mindset of he would never accept me. And people have this idea, well, let me get my life turned around and then I'll, you know, I'll go to Jesus. You'll never get No, go to Jesus around. and he'll turn your life around. Yes. That's the thing. That's what. And it is as a, I mean, a, a human, we, it's hard for that to get into our mindset of if we can just go to him, he'll change us for, for us. We right. don't have to do anything. You know, that's right. not to say all of a sudden, as soon as we stand up, all of our, you know, cares, whatever's gone, but he will be there with us to help us change our life from there. Right. He doesn't expect us to be perfect from that moment on. Uh, but I, I feel like that's a lot of the reasons why people, are very hesitant sometimes they're just standing there thinking well i know i need to go forward but he will never accept me you know or or, i've done this i've done that and he would never forgive those sins or whatever that's just simply not the case right all right next question what must i do to be saved it's as simple as a b c you must admit that you're a sinner you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you must confess Jesus Christ to the world. Simple. A lot of times people, and this is kind of where I get off the boat, people want to lead others in a sinner's prayer. I, I believe there is no power in the sinner's prayer. There, I mean, it's some words, but I believe that it's more an act, the act of faith that you're placing in Jesus Christ than it is the words that you're speaking. You must believe from the bottom of your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sin and that he rose again conquering death, hell, and the grave. And once you do that, You're saved. Yeah, because like you say, the sinner's prayer, If you you can pray all day long. Right. But if you just say words that's on a paper. Right. Or, or repeat words that yes. somebody else is saying. Right. Okay, so sometimes some people will take you down the Roman, what they call the Romans road, okay? And in that, we have Romans 3.10, 
which says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that goes along with the A of admit. Both of those is admitting that we're a sinner and we are all sinners. Okay. And then Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that would go along with the B, to believe. We have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for our sins, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. And he did that just for a gift for, gift for us, just to go to heaven. Then Romans 10, 9 and 10 say that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans ten thirteen says, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord, I'm sorry, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that goes along with the C of confessing. Yes. Once we admit, believe, then we confess, and we confess that Jesus is Lord. And we go from there. Absolutely. Brian, got anything else to add to that? I think that sums it up. Yeah, I think so. Good job, Miss Becky. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Becky. That's quick work on your phone. <laughs> Better than you were doing. <laughs> I got it in my head. All right, so last question we have for today. What do I do after I get saved? Absolutely. And I think that is a big question, though. I mean, because some people think I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. You know, I've just been, I've been living how I want to. I'm saved now. Some people have that mindset right. of once saved, always saved. And they take it real literal. Right. Um, You know, I've been saved, so now I won't go to heaven. So why not just do what I want to do? And that's just not, that's, that's not the case. So what do I do after I get saved? Well, the first thing you do is you tell somebody. That you got saved. Yep. Yes. Yep. You don't want to keep it to yourself. Yeah. No. Once you receive that gift, you should have the desire for every person you come in contact with to have that same experience you have. Yeah. I mean, you get you get the brand new cell phone, brand new iPhone. What right. do you do? You, you, you show tell everybody. everybody. You post it on Facebook. Hey, I got the brand new iPhone 16 Pro Max. You know, you get a new bike for Christmas or a new whatever. Your new vehicle. Right. You're going to take a picture of it. Post it on Facebook. Tell everybody. Yep. It is weird, though, that a lot of people, when it comes to our religious lives or whatever, we're real secretive, secretive about it. Yeah. I don't know why, you know. But, yeah. I mean, that is one thing. Why wouldn't you brag about it? You know? for I guess for a lack of better words. Because. You know, telling everybody. Well, you wouldn't brag about it because you're afraid of the persecution. Yeah, that's true. And, and when I say persecution, I don't mean just like being killed persecution, but the people making fun of you, the the ones ridicul ridiculing you, and just peer pressure is a real looking down on a you. real thing. Yes, it is. But after you tell somebody, you follow the Lord's example in b baptism, which is where you are put to death with Christ in the water and raised again a new man, just like Jesus Christ. Because, I mean, Jesus set that example for us in his baptism. Right. And that is a, it's a, pro, a public profession of you following Jesus Christ. Is what baptism, bad, the baptism won't save you. Yes. It's just a... Outward expression. Outward expression of... Your new belief in Christ. Right. And then I would say you need to find you a good godly church. Get in it and go. Get active. And then you need to get in the word. Wouldn't hurt to find someone that you know 
if you know someone that could be a good godly mentor to you, Mm -hmm. because that's what we fail to do sometimes. We, like you were saying, we accept Jesus, we're saved, and then we think, oh, okay, that's all I have to do. Yes. But you have to get into the word and you have to you have to build a relationship. Uh, Christianity is more than just being saved, not going to hell. Um, a lot of times, like like with my testimony, that's that's the reason I wanted to be saved was so I wouldn't go to hell. But you need to have that relationship with God, with Jesus, so that you know there is a God. Right. And once you start learning more and more about him, then you'll start knowing that he's real. Right. And I guess along the same question, what do I do after I get saved? One thing you don't do is expect everything to be perfect. You know, exactly. Don't expect, um, you won't ever have temptations come along your way. You won't ever fall short. Um, you know, we are going to fall short. We can't just have in our mindset, oh, well, God will forgive me if I, you know, sin, I'll just repent, whatever. You've got to actually be sorry, you know, for that repentance. You've got to know that you're doing wrong and try to stay away from doing that same thing. Right. Um, but we do fall short. We're human. You know, we, we have things come up. We, we uh, you know, get tempted. We, we fall short daily. And as long as we strive to do better, there's that grace. Right. Well, you have to remember, though, that that now the enemy has lost you. Yes. You're not going to you're not going to hell now. You're not one of his anymore. Yep. So he's going to throw out all kind of obstacles because he can't he can't get you. So now he's just yep. trying to hurt you or make you stumble and fall. Exactly. So I guess one other thing, what do I do after I get saved? Put your guard up. Yes. You know, be prepared yes. that your life is. That's why you have to get in the word. Yes. And like you said, kind of get with a mentor. Even I think just getting around people that like-minded yes. people. Yes. Um, you and, just, you just kind of, just like all of us, we, you know, we associate with each other in yes. church and out of church. Right. Because, you know. We're we're all we can all be ridiculed together. It's not so bad when you have a friend. <laughs> exactly. Or if we get yelled at by Miss Becky before the podcast starts. True. True. <laughs> but you're right. I mean That was Aaron's fault. It is Aaron's fault. What did I do? <laughs> Aaron's that quiet uh quiet one in the background that just speaks up every once in a while. What did I do? Well, I would say <laughs> following up with all of y'all said, after you follow through with all that. It's time to go to work. Yeah. Yes. Because we're commissioned to get out and spread what happened to us. Yes. Spread, spread the good news of the gospel. So share it with everybody. If you get saved, share it with people. Share it with your friends. Because you may reach someone that I can't reach. Exactly. Use your peer pressure the opposite way and share Jesus with them. True. True. Yeah. So I guess after we get saved, our work really is just beginning. Absolutely. Yes. There's a lot more to do. A lot more. A lot so more people to reach. That's all of the actual questions that I that I guess Brian come up with. And I don't know, I'm just gonna share this. I don't know why in going over these questions why this come to mind, but I'll share it anyway. It wasn't a question. But I guess talking about who is Jesus, um, what must I do to be saved and, and different things just made my mind go to um, like the Bible, and I feel like a lot of times we, especially here in America, so we have Bibles all over the place. I've got four or five in my office. We have, I walk around with one every single day on my phone. Most all of us do. It's on the iPad. And I think a lot of times we kind of turn Jesus into a a story kind of thing. I feel like we. Uh, we know he's he was human. We know he's real, but but I feel like sometimes we take for granted the actual life of Jesus. The actual I know it's a story, but it's I feel like sometimes we make it into like a fiction kind of 
Not kind like, of thing. It, like he wasn't real. He's yes. just a. Uh, yeah, I mean, a mythical creature. Kind of. And like even with Sunday school for children and stuff, we have children's storybooks. They're colorful images. We put images with these certain verses, and you know, it, which is fine. It is teaching them something, but I think as much as we see that every single Sunday or every day or whatever, it just almost kind of takes away from his actual true story, I feel like. Because there's people in the world that literally risk their lives to have a Bible. And we can download one for free. You know, and and we walk around with it every day in our pocket and never even look at it. Exactly. You know, because today, I just going over... Uh, the podcast questions and stuff was probably the first time I pulled up the Bible on my phone in a while. I've got it with me every single day. And, you know, I look at the Bible, my actual handheld Bible and, and different stuff, but thinking about that, that just makes me think, you know, if I pull up the screen time on my phone, if I pull up TikTok, how, how many hours have I spent every day on TikTok or Facebook or, you know, whatever. But then if I scroll down to the very 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 bottom and look for the bible app it says zero you know and that just i don't know why that came to my mind when when studying for these but i guess it's my own conviction or whatever but anyway i just i just feel like sometimes we we take for granted the access we have to his actual word and you use the word autobiography or try to use that word er (laughs) earlier yeah. yeah And the Bible, it's not an autobiography. He didn't write it, but it is the inspired word of God. Right. And it's, it's, it's a history book. But I feel like, I don't know why, I just feel like we've turned it into just a storybook. Yeah, it's good. But if you get into it and you get to reading, it becomes actually like a living. Yes. Right. And and I think maybe some, maybe some of that's the devil, you know, because, you know, mm-hmm. He's he's kind of wanting us to, to downplay it, almost. I agree. Absolutely. So that wasn't a question, but just to throw out my, my thought there. It but that good. But that is all the questions that we have for today. That ends today's episode of Why Jesus. Um, I'm going to leave it like we did last week. I don't know when the next one will be, if it'll be next week or if it'll be uh, just whenever the Lord tells us, hey, here's your topic, we're going to do it. I would love for it to be a weekly thing, but I don't want to, I don't know if rush is the right word. I want to do it justice. You know, I don't want, I don't want to just throw something together. So we'll, we'll have another episode uh, when the Lord says, Hey, this is the episode you're going to do. If you do have questions, if you have comments or anything, please email them to us. Media at drivealleybaptist.com. Uh, until next time, Brian, thanks for being here. Yep. Miss Becky, thank you. Thank you. Aaron, thank you. Thank you, Chad. Thanks, Chad. And we will see you all next time on Divine Vision. That was good. That was... And music.